very good to see so many of you enjoying your refreshments. And thank you to Pat. There she is, Pat O'Neill. Thank you for refreshments today. We always appreciate it, and I'm sure look forward to it. Um, I have a couple things on WOC that I want to share with you. First of all, you may have noticed when you signed up, I have the cards about Ladies' Day Out, which is coming up uh, still in January the 27th, and we have not reached the deadline for uh, registering for that. So pick up a card if you'd like to, follow instructions on there to turn in your reservation and come. Um, it's, it's a fun place and a fun time. Uh, with lots of people, but they always fill up, so don't think you can do it at the last minute. It'll be full. Uh, we also have uh, the WOC uh, luncheon, spring luncheon. Uh, spring luncheon is going to be a little earlier this year, and it's going to be in February. Um, so uh, the last Monday in February, I do not have, they haven't come out with the cards yet. I'll probably have those next month, and it'll still be in time, but be thinking about it. It... Uh, it promises to be good as always. Um, as I say, thank you for finding the location today. And um, uh, I will mention now and probably again at the end that next month we will be in Westminster. And that is because Hank, has, who will be our speaker, has requested that it's easy for him to be set up with his slides, which he'll be showing. So we will be in there, and then hopefully the next month we'll be back in McCullough. Um, I'm very excited to introduce to a new first-time Literature Circle reviewer today. Uh, Janet is a native San Antonian. She graduated from Elmo Heights High School followed by a graduation from Texas Christian University with a BA in English and History. Now, how appropriate is that for today? She taught middle school Texas history and English reading for 23 years. She was married to Fritz, and together they have two children, Matt and Christina, followed by five grandchildren. Since retiring 18 years ago, she has lovingly served the church, traveled, enjoyed time with friends and family, but always finding time to read. With this perfect background to review the, the captured, I'm sure we're all very excited and, and very happy to welcome Janet Worley to our, to our podium today. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. I'm excited to be here, too. Um, I would say I'm a frustrated 18-year um, teacher in, in retirement. Uh, so the, today, you're, you're my class. And, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm glad to have you here and excited to talk about um, Texas history. Um, I'm going to start actually by telling you a little bit how I came to be um, so enamored with the history of our state, and I certainly didn't plan on it. Um, my interest actually started in 1968 when I was a 20-year-old college sophomore and came home to San Antonio to find our city in the midst of a hemisphere. And um, like lots of my friends wanted to get a job, so I went to a few of the places, but really loved what was then called the Texas Pavilion. It is now the Institute of Texan Cultures and couldn't be a more wonderful place. It's in a little bit of transition right now as they decide what to do with this wonderful collection and to make it more visible um, to hometown folks, but also tourists too. Um, so I got to work there almost three months, and actually I think I only got the job because I could speak Spanish. At that time, Spanish was my minor, and they were really looking for um, a, a wide, diverse variety of people to be guides there at the Institute because, of course, we were talking about 
the, the many ethnic groups and showing the world the many ethnic groups that formed our great state. So uh, it, was, it was wonderful to get to be there and that is when I began to fall in love with Texas history and, and everything about it. Um, my family, uh, fifth generation Texan, my, my father's family was from East Texas and his mother actually was from Central Texas and she, because of that location, her family knew um, several families that had had uh, children captured at some point in their history, and especially the Parker family that were still there in that area, living in that area, and uh, Cynthia Ann Parker's probably the most uh, famous Indian captive of all time. And we'll talk about her a little bit. Uh, the book speaks of her a bit. Um, my mother's family lived up on the Red River, Electra, which is west of Wichita Falls, on a, on a great big ranch, uh, two-section ranch, but also that history that um, they grew up with and knew was filled with stories of the Indian Wars, the Red River Wars. So I think I grew up hearing a lot about uh, this cultural conflict that happened um, very dramatically in Texas. It happened in other parts of our country, but Texas, it certainly it was, we, we were the battleground for a long time between pioneers, settlers, and native tribes. Um, Scott Zesch, in this remarkable book, um, the, the Captured, and I've heard other people who've read it uh, mention and just say captured. Well, it really is the captured because it focuses entirely on the lives, the families um, that experienced this tragic but remarkable event that happened to their family, a child or more than one child, captured by um, a group of Indians. Um, Scott Zesch's own story um, centers right in the, the area and I have a map for you. And you, you ha if you have your book, you have a map you know, in it, but I ran some off anyway because I didn't really know who was going to have their book. There are two. The first one is just a general look at Texas and the area, thank you, the area um, and locations noted where many of this would happen. The second little map is specific to the Mason area, which was really bounded by, and um, you know, in, my husband was a geologist and, and in, that, in that profession and life and in many others, uh, you describe territory by meets and bounds. And the meets and bounds of land were usually rivers are other kinds of physical types of um, locations. But the area that we're really gonna talk about a lot is around the city of Mason, present day Mason, and it's bounded on the east by the Colorado, on the north by the Llano, and on the south by the Pernales. So not a very big area, but it also happens to be the territory of the southern herd of buffalo. I'm gonna mention them first because that's what brought the Southern Plains Indians into our homeland, into our country, was following the buffalo. So even into San Antonio, even in that area, there were, it's hard to imagine at this point, but in the 1800s and certainly the 1700s, there were herds of buffalo in our area around. Scott Zesch, in writing this book, is on a true quest because 
if you've read the book, you realize that he uh, is with his family at one point. They go to their family cemetery where there are many German-American families buried there. And he realizes that one member, as he walks around, and he knows the last name of his family is Korn, K-O-R-N, and one family member is not buried with the others. He is off beside by himself in an unkempt uh, gravesite with a tiny marker that is barely readable at this point, and it shows that he died in 1900. Um, so he's curious about it. He asks about it, and um, his family goes on to explain. Well, he was, you know, he was just a little different. We really, you know, we weren't sure um, where he was at times, and. He had heard the rumored stories as he grew up of his great, great, great uncle, Rudolf, uh, um, Adolf, being captured. He'd heard them, but he didn't really know much about it, and for the life of him, he couldn't figure out why he wasn't buried with the rest of the family. So this is what led him and began him on his quest to find out why, and in that quest, he finds out about the stories of many captives all over the state. Um, Scott grew up on a ranch, loved the outdoors. He lives on a ranch today, still, um, but his education background is interesting. He he went to A&M, graduated from A&M, and then he went to Harvard Law, which for me explains why this book is so remarkably researched. I mean, he he was someone who loved research and took this opportunity to find out. It's about 300 pages, maybe a little more than that, but it has 80 pages of bibliography, notes, and index, almost a third of what, you know, the actual book has. So, um, so many wonderful and perfect sources for, um, this is my teacher coming out of me, but sources uh, for research, original documents, uh, letters, memoirs, um, even interviews with these people. And in a minute, I'll show you a few pictures. You have them in the center of your book, but Sam was smart enough to get them up on the, the video for me. Um, but all of these kinds of original source materials are the kinds that you hope to find when you're researching not secondary source. In other words, a story, a story told by a story told by somebody else. You want to find the original source material because it can be trusted. You know, it can be trusted as more closely to the truth. The interesting thing to me as I read this book is how the captives that were taken, and it, we're just going to focus on the German-American captives, but the tribes of um, in and around Texas took very diverse captives, um, Mexican, black. Th they had no problem with anyone. They really saw no difference. They were just taking a captive at that point. Some were killed, some were captured, some were tortured, and some were adopted. And we'll really spend some time talking about how that happened, you know, to some of the the young people. And it was mostly children. They really did not um, take much time. <laughs> and the grim the grim stories of this book are about how the adults were killed, but most children were taken, cared for, carefully gotten back to to the camp and made part of their tribe. Um, so it's, it's their story that we're most interested in. And the other thing that goes with that is that most of these child captives defended to the end of their life. Their captors defended them, uh, praised them, loved them, and went back to visit them many times after they were brought back home. Adolf's story is uh, like most of them. He has had a twin brother, Charlie, and in the middle of the day, they're herding sheep, uh, and he is captured 
and Charlie is able to scoot into the brush and, and is not captured. But Adolf is captured. They throw him on a horse and he he doesn't um, he doesn't resist or try to try to get off. He falls off the horse on their way on their long ride uh, towards North Texas and is injured. And it's an injury for life. So he's crippled pretty much the whole time, all the time that he's with the uh, Indians. But this does not seem to be anything that concerns them because he can ride a horse. And, and that's the great skill that he becomes um, valuable for. The, the life on, in this hill country area, if you're looking at that smaller map, in this hill country area was, was tough. Um, other offers, authors have called it and named it hard scrabble life. Uh, it's the Texas Hill Country. The Spanish called it the Llano Estacado, which was really a term staked plain. And um, maybe Enchanted Rock is the largest of these rock formations, but most of that area is very thin topsoil, you know, not good for farming, barely good for ranching, um, but lots of sheep herding, goat herding areas up there, and that's that was the life that was um, given and accepted by these German-American settlers. And we'll talk about how they got there because it, it was a definite choice for them to go. Um, between 1830 and 1880, lots of European immigrants came um, to America through the South and eventually to Texas because of free land, because of cheap land, because of land where they would have never been able to have this much land in Europe. They could have a fairly good amount of land in Texas. Um, the kind of land that the uh, German settlers chose was interesting. Uh, they settled all the way from what is now Houston all the way up into the Mason area. San Antonio, we have a huge um, early population of... Um, skilled, and I would say that's probably where our skilled German families came, was to San Antonio. But those that were not and hoped to have land and farm went into the hill country. It wasn't an idyllic life. Uh, the weather was terrible. There was no school. Um, they were probably the only two books in the house were a German Bible and, and an almanac. They didn't really spend much time teaching their children, even at home. Um, so most of these young men and women that we're going to talk about were illiterate at the time they were uh, captured and, and stayed that way for a lot of their lives. Up until the Civil War, the, the German families in that area seemed to be able to live. Not well, but they seemed to be able to live. Lots of their their business and trading and commerce was with the U.S. government, the cavalry. They would sell things to them. But at the time of the Civil War, Texas secedes, and they lose all of those government uh, contracts that they had. So life becomes much harder. Um, and even before the corns moved to this area, um, they should have been wary. They they visited once some some friends, the Rakanaws, and the Rakanaws cabin had a big stockade around it with sharpened picket, a big sharpened picket fence and gate. That should have told them right away, you know, they're expecting trouble, and um, that was a warning. And it was to keep that family safe, and and the corns really. Um, may not have believed that danger was as close as it was. I'm going to read one thing to you real quick. The book has so many different wonderful descriptions to read, but I've just picked out some. The Rackinaws weren't overreacting, for the threat of Indian raids was very real. On April 2nd, 1862, only a few months before the Rackinaws and the Corns arrived, the Saline community, which was a tiny little, not a town, but just an area, had been shocked by a triple murder. 
When a settler named Felix Hale went to his elderly neighbor's place to return a wash kettle, he found their cabin on fire and feathers from a mattress strewn about the yard. Near the house, he discovered the charred body of Henry Parks, age 77. His wife, Nancy, 72, had been killed near the cow pen. Along the creek lay the body of their 12-year-old grandson, Billy. All three had been scalped. So, danger... Uh, warnings of this and actual occurrences should have been enough to to keep anybody from safely settling there but but they did there was help the Texas Rangers especially were a group that spent um, their lives in that in that decade pursuing the Indians, the tribes, Comanches especially, also Apaches, Kiowas, um, that were attacking and raiding the settlers. But they figured out that if they didn't find and retrieve this captive in two to three days, it wasn't going to happen. They were too far away. These well-mounted tribes could outrun them most of the time. So uh, much much of the time, the search was given up. The families would stay hopeful. The families would put out advertisements. They tried every type of um, important person that they might know to, to help with this um, and in papers, newspapers and stuff that would have been in the area, but very few were retrieved that way. Retrieval of these captives is going to take place later in other in other manner. And this quote I, I found so interesting and just give you kind of an idea of what the Indians were thinking. And one one Comanche was said to explain, we shoot the men because it was better to shoot them than to let them starve. Um, it's at this point that I, I kind of want to spend a minute talking about the difference um, in the way the two groups, the two cultures, viewed the land. Um, the Indians were adept at taking from the land what they needed. Animals, fruits, uh, pecans. I mean, they knew when seasons were coming and they would gather those things, but hunting, mostly, was just their livelihood. The buffalo was their H-E-B. I mean, they used most of it. They were able to to uh, live on that and um, actually pretty well, you know, and their, their construction of homes was so much more appropriate for the weather and, and their nomadic life, being able to put it up, take it down quickly, go, than the sedentary life of the settlers, which was hard. And um, later when we talk about why did these captive boys stay, you'll want to think about, you know, what, what they had to do on a farm and what they got to do as a Comanche warrior, which many of them became. In about 1847, so I'm jumping backwards for you, in about 1847, a remarkable thing happens as these new German settlers come in to... Texas. Um, they settle in New Braunfels. They settle in in and around Fredericksburg. And in Fredericksburg especially, one man uh, who was the leader of the group and had a family um, with these German settlers, John Moisbach, um, decides very early on that something needs to be done to help protect his group from these Indian raids. And so he literally calls a, a council of peace with them. The Comanches are, are very willing. They come in and talk about it. And two chiefs in particular um, become friends with John Moisbach. And he, um, for a short period of time, less than two years, there is a, a very um, fragile but a workable peace between the citizens and the families in and around Fredericksburg and the Comanches of that area. 
Okay, I'm going to read something to you in a minute that is from that treaty that they make. Um, Sam Houston had actually, who was a, a great supporter of Native tribes, um, but he had actually talked about this earlier. And this is about 1846, 47 right before statehood, right at statehood, annexation. And he had said, we, we've got to do something to separate, to give our settlers land, but also to honor the hunting grounds and the land of these native tribes who were here long before us and plan to stay because this is their home too. So he um, puts together in his mind and and talks to the U.S. government about let's just let's do a boundary line so that settlers will not move any farther west than this line. Um, that all falls apart at annexation because the United States government has promised uh, in the annexation documents that settlers may have all the land and the freedom and the and the manifest destiny that they are. Um, entitled to as American citizens. So one thing I'll say right now, there wasn't in the mind of the American government a designation of American citizens for the Indian tribes of the United States. They didn't consider them actually part of that. Um, so this, this idea of a boundary goes away and also, with the help of a, a very strong, I'd say, lobby group now, it's, it appears it would be like that, called the Society for the Protection of German Immigrants of Texas. Um, and it was part of a huge Spanish land grant called the Fisher Miller Grant um, that was awarded early, probably in before 1830, um, to the early, early settlers that came in, 6,000 6, square miles, if that's, you know, able to think, way out into West Texas, that huge land grant was awarded them, and so that's, that's where they could move. The settlers could move anywhere they wanted to when annexation took place. So the idea of, of uh, free roaming and unencumbered hunting was gone at that point. Um, this particular treaty that we talked about between the Fredericksburg uh, families and the Comanches worked pretty well for a couple of years, and I want to read a part of it for you. Let me see if I can find it. It's really very beautiful, and what I'm going to read to you is what they wrote at that time, and in 1997, 150 years after that, it was renewed. Uh, the city of Fredericksburg decided it was time to recognize um, an old agreement that had been you know, promised many years before, but it says, we are the promise of our ancestors, we agree to uphold the treaty of peace made between the people of Fredericksburg and the Comanche Nation. We are not afraid of war. We choose peace. We shall walk the path of peace and protect each other. We shall give support to those among us in need. We shall not recognize any line of distinction between us because we are one people and choose to live together as such. We affirm these ideals so our children will be our promise. Now that was written in 1847, but they reaffirmed it in 1997. It's, it's such a shame to think that that couldn't have been held on to, you know, those years before. Between about 1850 and 1870, I would call it the worst of times, that uh, in those years right before the Civil War, during the Civil War, where many men were not left at home in Texas, and up to 1870 into Reconstruction, this was a, a high time of Indian captives in that area. 19 German Americans were murdered by Indians. There is no record kept, though, of Indian deaths. There was no record 
of what happened in retribution, you know, for these captures, and there was. Um, still, to look back on it in all that they've written about it, there was no attitude of these German Americans, even those that, have, that had lost children, you know, to the Indians of this awful old phrase, I, I, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. They just did not believe that was true. They put the blame for many of these captives being taken on the Texas Rangers, the U.S. military, and the frontier fort system, which had been built all the way from the Rio Grande, go all the way to El Paso. This was a line of defense that was built to protect settlers, and really instead of um, protecting settlers at some point, it did stir up hostility toward the tribes that roamed that area. So by 1860, I'd say there was real fear, where they had come into the the land of the hill country feeling like we can survive this, we can protect ourselves. By about 1860, that was really gone. Um, that was the year Rudolph Fisher was um, captured. He was 13 and a, a teenager, you know, almost a teenager, and uh, he would go on to be a warrior that fought in the last battle um, between the Indians and the cavalry by 1878. So um, life changed dramatically for him. He was one of the ones that chose to stay. He was one of the ones that loved the warrior life. And um, this is gonna happen to several others. The captive boys didn't talk much when they got those that came back home didn't really talk much about it. It's interesting that they're gonna go on later in their late years of life and um, publish things, write memoirs, publish their story for everyone to hear. Uh, I thought one of the most interesting, mysterious um, stories of capture in this book were a brother and sister, Dot and Bank Bab, and um, their, their recollections of life with the Comanches, as who they lived with, was glowing. In fact, both of them talked about their other family, went back to visit their other family. And um, this was, you know, why did this happen? This was one of the things that I kept questioning, you know, as I, because life probably was fairly rough for them at the beginning, but as they became accustomed and loved their new mother, new father, all the things that went on in a camp, they, they generally became very attached you know, to that family. So why did these Indians take captives? It's, it's been a, a puzzle um, for lots of people for a long time because they treated their own children very well. They treated these captive children very well. So why did they take them? Well, probably for ransom, commercial. They could ransom them for other things they needed. Uh, also, sometimes as adoption, to replace a child who had died, to replace another family member who had died. Um, taking captives is rather historical. If you think about other, other countries, other times in history, it is rather historical. And they almost always took children. You know, as they said earlier, they really didn't have any use for um, the adults, and some, some of the stories are rather grim and atrocities of what happened to babies that might have been there. But children, they could um, help them learn to love the tribal life and help them learn to be warriors or, or wonderful, um, the young women, you know, wonderful Indian maidens, which was a very respected uh, position. Um, I'm going to read a little bit of what Bank Bab said about what happened to her. Uh, the women cared for her, took took great care of her. She ate anytime she wanted to, and I think it was funny they always ate standing up. 
out of a big pot, but any time you were hungry, there was something to eat. Not a certain meal time, not anything specific, but just any time you were hungry. They dressed her in beautiful ornamental clothes. They did dark, she was blonde, and they did darken her hair because they really wanted her to look like the rest of them. And, and some of that is because they didn't want her recaptured again. They didn't want her noticed or recognized, so they would darken her hair. Um, there was lots of play. There was work, you know, and, and actually very um, constructive work that you learned to do and was, would be very fun for children um, to do. Not a lot of sitting up and down and doing things, and a lot of play and no correction. They did not correct their children at all. No punishment, no correction. You learned by example of um, others' behavior that you were around. Um, never punished. And the young men, too, that was the other thing, is they learned to become warriors, riding, shooting, making arrows, doing all this. There was never punishment, but... Um, and I, I thought the very interesting thing was they never put them in a position that I read about in the book where they would have to kill or harm a white settler. They didn't really think they should put them in that position, so they didn't. Let's talk a little about Legion Valley. On your map, um, it shows, it's kind of in the middle of that territory. It had a great deal of Indian captives taken you know, from that area. And because of that, the first real treaty that holds on for a while is put into effect. In 1867, the Medicine Lodge Treaty um, brought to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, uh, many chiefs, uh, cavalry, um, Indian agents all came to try to talk out this problem and see what to do. Well, the U.S. government had already decided that reservations, Indian reservations, were the solution, not, not anything else. So, hoping to convince, I'm sure, hoping to convince them that this was the idea that they would be provided with um, all that they needed, but this is what they couldn't do. They couldn't roam anymore. They had to give up uh, their hunting territory. They could not raid anymore. Uh, they had to stop taking captives. On the part of the U.S. government, they would provide houses, churches. I want, want you to, as you listen to this, listen how applicable this might have been for Native tribes. Houses, churches, teachers, and, and other civilized types of, well, civilized to, to uh, settlers types of um, needs. Food, rations, been given rations so that they'd have plenty of food. Um, but that the white settlers would still, and this was the big question on the Medicine Lodge Treaty, that the settlers would still get all the good land. I mean, it was still designated out and the settlers would be able to choose the land they wanted. Um, what was not said that day was that already in effect with buffalo hunters and buffalo skinners because of the great demand for buffalo hides uh, in the eastern United States and in Europe, the buffalo were being, even at that time, systematically uh, almost hunted to extinction. Almost. I mean, we're lucky we still have them, uh, and it, it happened absolutely by accident that someone in Washington finally said, we better slow this down. We're not going to have any more. And, and they slowed down the hunting. But the Indian had to watch their big food source being completely decimated and know that that's what was going to happen uh, to them and that they were going to suffer because of it. One thing I want to mention because you read about it a lot in the book, but murder, killing, was never the, the goal of a raid. It was always, almost always to take horses or to take some kind of provisions that they might have seen there at the time. But um, Indian captives were just a plus if 
children or someone were out in the yard, they, they would take one of the children or more than one of the children at the time. But it was almost always to take horses uh, that they needed desperately, and, and they really kept um, that, that kind of supply uh, of horses is their, is their great currency and their great talent. Uh, they were the, the Comanches, Comanches especially was, were the horse court culture of uh, America and um, no one really um, ever came close to being comparable to them. Uh, they were said to be the greatest light cavalry in the world uh, when they were, you know, all together. Um, in fact, there is a full moon, I think not tonight, but maybe tomorrow night. So it's a good time to mention that when these raids, these things that went on uh, were happening, many times they planned them during a full moon so that they could see, so that they could escape, um, so that, you know, there was, it was the perfect time to get out you know, and do this, and, and so that full moon, especially in the fall, I don't know whether that moon is called this all year long, but in the fall it is called a Comanche moon um, because it's during that time period when they would have um, gone out and done a lot of raiding. I'm going to skip a little bit because I, I know how long this goes, I know how long the book is. Uh, okay. I'm going to talk about, I'm not going to read about, but I'm going to talk about Matilda Friend a little bit uh, because you may have read it. It's, it's just this mm, grim story of um, a family that all the men are gone. They're all on, out, you know, gone to trade or, or take goods to sell, and there are only women and children left there at their cabin, and Indians attack the cabin, and they stab her and shoot arrows into Matilda Friend as she tries to protect the children. Two are taken that day. Another woman is killed. Her sister-in-law is killed at the time. And remarkably, um, the Indians leave thinking she was dead. She, they come back in one more time, and she has crawled off. They've thrown her onto a bed, and she's crawled off, and they see she's still alive, and they stab her some more and scalp her. This woman still can't walk at all, but she crawls to a nearby friend's cabin and survives this horrible attack um, to eventually one day see her two children return to her. So it's, the, this is how tough these people were and how determined they were, you know, to, to be there at all odds. Um, many cultural differences, in, and I think it becomes clear, you know, as you, as you read the book, that um, there, there's so much dissimilarity, not just nomadic life and sedentary life, but um, religion, um, what they ate, they, Indian tribes ate mostly meat, m meat and fruit, uh, what they could gather. Um, and because of this, there's just very little um, common ground, and they, they don't look for it. They, the white settlers really do not look for it. Um, the boy warriors, you can imagine how the life of a boy warrior, it was tough and hard. It was riding and shooting, dressing the part, a lot of courage, a lot of tested skills as they learned these things so different from their drudgery farm life that probably wasn't fun at all and, and very disciplined, extremely disciplined. Um, two brothers, Herman and, and Willie Lehman, um, were with the Apaches. Just two different stories. Willie got home, wanted to go home. Herman stayed and literally lived his last six years of life with them, went back at the end of his life and decided this is where I really want to be and I'm not going to spend one more day um, here. And so just, you know, completely different stories. The famous story of Cynthia Ann Parker, and many of you probably know this, but she was captured in 1836 uh, when 
her family's compound or fort, they'd left the gates open, the children were outside playing, and Comanches rode up, and uh, as the adults tried to protect the children, they were killed, and the two children, John and Cynthia Ann and her cousin, I believe, were taken. She lives with them for 24 years. She, she is the wife to the chief, Pete Nakona. She is um, a full-fledged Indian, you know, um, maiden at that point. And her family never stops looking for her. And finally, they enlist a Texas Ranger, Sullivan Ross, Saul Ross. And he starts a search through North Texas, and there are sightings of her. Uh, on war parties, out on war party, parties that she had gone with her husband and part of the tribe. And so one day they recapture her, and she happens to have her little, her youngest child, uh, Topasana, prayer flower, and there are lots of translations of that, so I'm just telling you the one that I've heard the most. Um, she has two other sons, Quana and Pecos. Pecos's name is probably not right either. But Quana, her oldest son, was on the the war party that day, and his dad was killed. His father was killed. Never really forgot that. Um, it's what keeps him um, part of a, a warring element tribe so long, because he's a remarkable man. You know, and as we hear about him later, he does things for his tribe that only he could do to save them. Um, <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. So, last thing on on this part was really, why do you why do we think these young men stayed? Why do we think that uh, any of them, Cynthia Ann, in particular, her baby dies within a year of her recapture. She dies within two years, just malnutrition, like starvation. She just was miserable. She was so unhappy. She was not with her family. She'd been brought back to her home, her original home, but she was not with her family. And so hers is an extremely sad story. Uh, other of these captives turns out a little bit, a little bit happier, but why in the world did they want to stay? Well, there was some fear in the hearts of captives of being returned, um, either punishment or possibly um, losing their Indian families and their culture there. Um, they also wanted to, they stayed because they wanted to win approval from, from these Indian families that had become their own to make them proud and probably even to show them what a white settler was made of, to just show them what, what uh, we could do. And, and the boys especially were very determined that that happened. I want to stop a minute and show you some pictures and hope I can do this. Okay. That looks backwards, but that's okay. Um, this is pictures and not photographs, but drawings of some of the early um, peace treaties where and camps where um, the settlers probably and Indians were brought together to try to come to some agreements. Oh, I know, this is good. This is a really great photograph at the top of uh, an Indian camp um, and the way the teepees looked. Um, this is a picture of a little girl, um, Mimi Calder, I think, that was captured and brought back. And this is right after she got back. It, it also shows me the girls did better the girls assimilated and, and did better when they came back home. But again, never said a, a hateful word about their captors. They loved them and missed them. Uh, all right, three remarkable chiefs. Um, the two of them I know were involved. Coach uh, Muwe, we will talk about in a few minutes. And then Quanta Parker, who becomes the great um, savior of his nation, of the Comanches. Uh, oh, all right, and while we're on this one, we're gonna be talking in just a minute about the Red River Wars and, and Colonel Randall McKenzie. Um, he, he gets the nickname Indian Fighter because it, it becomes his goal in life to not just fight them to um, 
you know, a victory, but to get rid of them. We, we do not have any in Texas and never have had any Comanche or Apache reservations. We have two reservations in Texas, uh, one over on um, our eastern border, the Alabama Cushada Indians that are more um, like our Caddo Indians were, a peaceful, sedentary type of tribe, and the Kickapoos out in um, Eagle Pass, which actually were more like what, what we would consider um, the adobe dwelling Indians. That was more what the Kickapoos like. But we do not have any Plains Indians. Uh, okay, go. And this is the Temple Friend. That would be the, the son of Melinda Fr Matilda Friend, who um, somehow survived the terrible attack. That is San Antonio on the upper right, busy, thriving. And I th oh, in the bottom of it corner, I believe we're looking at a reservation um, and cattle herd on a reservation. Okay, I'm gonna stop right there and keep going. And somebody keep me up on time. Anybody? All right, we're gonna we're gonna move ahead quickly. Okay, and talk a minute about the Smith brothers. Um, Jeff and Clinton Smith lived with the Comanches for at least five years, and, and Jeff was captured probably after about six, recaptured after about six years. But I thought this was an interesting statement by Clinton Smith, who was right living right in that same area of Mason, that he encountered Adolf Korn in another tribe, in another part of the Comanche tribes, and said he was about the meanest Indian I ever knew. <laughs> Korn was a risk taker. He had been as a child. This didn't surprise his family. Uh, he was good at stealing horses, but the description in the book about him stealing horses was he always left the trap, he would steal them from travelers not from a cabin, but from travelers as they were going through the territory. And, but he always left them alive. And it was almost like it was a prank. In other words, to see if he could do it, to be able to see if he could pull it off. Um, the warrior life was dangerous, but it was also kind of carefree. Uh, they were the protectors and the providers for their tribe, but they did nothing else. They never cleaned an animal. They never made anything. They never prepared a skin. Everything else was done by women, by the women, but they were definitely the protectors and the providers of the food that they had. They had, uh, the, the book really talks about um, entertainment, uh, tribal style, raucous games, gambling, even killing when they had you know, these games going on, but they would just, that was what happened. That was what could happen if you were going to take part in it. Cleverness was well rewarded. In fact, Indian leaders uh, watched for that, that spark of intelligence in any one of these captives that would show cleverness and ability to make decisions and to become a leader. So that's what they were really working towards with these young men, not just battle, but for them to become leaders of the tribe. Um, good behavior, as I'd said before, came from observation, not punishment, not correction, not time out, nothing like that, just um, observing the good behavior, um, how possibly the father that he is, they were with treated their mother. It was, that there are very specific things that were not, not done, and we'll talk about that right now. First of all, I know you've heard that Indians don't have beards at all. They, they do, you know, as men, but they pluck everything out. It, it, it was, facial hair for Indians was abhorrent. They thought it was awful, unclean, not clean. So they got rid of all their hair, and for all the captive boys, they did the same thing. You know, they were not allowed to have any facial hair at all. Premarital sex was considered 
really an offense against the girl's family. Isn't that an interesting way that they were thinking about it, against the girl's family? So it was not, not looked upon it as well. And sometimes if it happened, that warrior, that young man would be sent away, not, you know, couldn't stay anymore. Um, I think I had mentioned that as much as they loved their their Indian families while they were there, they became, and it became known to others that they they were getting to where they hated their former families. And this came from the preaching, the, the, the real um, belief from their chiefs that if they did not fight for their land, they wouldn't survive. And so they had to be very determined to fight anyone who would take their land. And this certainly included those families that were living, uh, their own families that were still living back where they were. They were on Comanche land. Um, This was an interesting incident, I thought. Um, Herman Lehman was on a raid one night, and he realized that they were very close to his own family's home. And the other, he told the other warriors, and they said, well, we'll stop. You go in and see your mother. And they weren't taunting him or, you know, made that clear in the book. They weren't trying to make him do something just to see if he would do it. They said, no, no, you're here right now. You may not, you may not be here again. Go in and see your mother. And he wouldn't do it. And, you know, later talks about he, he wishes he had. And he gets to talk to his mother later and actually tells her he was there. And she's horrified. You know, she's very unhappy that not that he didn't come see her, but that they took horses that night that they took some of their horses away. But the, the attitude, I thought the attitude was interesting uh, on that, that they would want him to go ahead and reconnect with his family a little bit. I'm gonna read, oh, I'm gonna read one thing to you um, about the retaliation of the U.S. Army and the, and the Texas Rangers and why it was so difficult um, for any yeah, any of the Indians ha to have any kind of respect for this type of warfare. And this is, an in this is Herman Lehman talking about a, um, another time when Herman was raiding with some Comanches on the Texas Plains in the spring of 1877. His party returned to their camp at um, Kemada Lake and found that soldiers from the 10th Cavalry had attacked it. He wrote, I remember finding the body of Botsina, a very brave warrior, lying mutilated and scalped, and alongside of him was the horribly mangled remains of his daughter, Nuru, a beautiful Indian maiden who had been disemboweled and scalped. In our council, we swore to take 10 captive white women and twice as many white children and to avenge the death of our squaws, especially Nuru. We vowed to kill a white woman for each year of her age, she was about 18 years old, and that we would disembowel everyone we killed. So they were um, completely not surprised but I think horrified, horrified at the same behaviors happening to their people that had happened, you know, they had done at times to other white settlers. And the war rages on, and it's going to get much worse. Um, William Tecumseh Sherman um, at that point is the um, director, I'd say, of all Indian affairs, and he gets the Indian agents involved. They tour Texas. Um, all parties of the uh, military and the Texas Rangers and even the Quakers who are going to come in and try to help with negotiations assume that mistreatment is part of what the captives go through, true mistreatment, torture. What, what they go through. So this, this spurs this on. By 1868, President Grant wanted a new peace treaty. 
The only real bargaining thing that they had was food, rations, and all of the tribes, you know, start deciding this is something they can do, except the one part of the Comanches, the uh, Quahata Indians, and that's Quanta Parker's part, and they do not want to come in and are not going to come in. Um, Rudolph Fisher um, was offered and was found and offered a return to home, and he refused it. He stayed. He was kind of Quanta Parker's right-hand man. They were about the same age and had kind of grown up together, and he was not going to, well, not going to go back. Um, in 1872, the U.S. Army campaign brought 26 women and children captives home. Um, by 1875, many of the others had been brought back. But Starting back in 1872, the Red River Wars began, and this is the, the first big um, initial government decision to wipe out the Indians. Either wipe them out or put them on reservations to watch them carefully and manage anything that happened to them. Um, at that point, Randall McKenzie, the Indian fighter, um, would release some of the Indian prisoners until, he, and he wouldn't release them until the captives were released. And the captives, captives were actually kind of terrified of this. Remember, we're talking about children that might not want to go back, might not want to go back, and were a little afraid to go back. Uh, we're not sure what they remember, but they, they don't want to leave their homes with the tribes at this point. While the, uh, the Red River Wars are going on, something interesting happens. The chief, um, usually in a tribe there was a war chief and a peace chief, and the peace chief of all of these Comanches at that point was Chief um, Moray, and we saw his picture a minute ago. Um, but he was in Washington, D.C. with a delegation. He had been sent and asked to come. Um, to meet with President Grant. So they toured Washington, D.C., did not think much of it, were not impressed. Then they went on to New York. They went to a play. They went to the circus. They went to Central Park, which one of them considered to be a, a prime place to hunt. You know, was there were there animals to hunt here? And then they went on back to Chicago, uh, not entirely impressed with anything that they had seen or desirous of that life. And on the, not until the way home did the soldiers that were with them tell them about the Red River Wars and how much it had disseminated much of their tribe. Um, oh, Clinton Smith got to come back and was returned home and right before he got home, they kept him at Fort Sill for a while, just like in a jail cell. Um, and with another young man who's later, who is later identified as Adolph Korn, at first they don't know who it is. But the very first thing they do to the boys is scrub them, um, you know, strip them down, throw away all their clothes, all their Indian clothes, cut off all of their hair really short. And in fact, he describes it as humiliating us. Was that done just, you know, to be mean and humiliate us? Which they think it was, because it, it was very humiliating for them. Um, the Quakers decide to put them in school for a little while. And I thought the most interesting thing was but but very understandable. They were terrified of being inside. They wouldn't sleep inside. They had a really hard time eating inside. The food made them sick. Um, they were used to eating, you know, raw meat or, or mostly cooked meat outside. So the boys were very anxious and terrified of being inside, and they finally let them, you know, in an in enclosed area stay outside. Um, they were then taken by, the parents were too afraid to come get them. So the parents don't come and retrieve these little boys. And why I say little, they're probably 14, 15 at this point. They don't come and get them because they're afraid of Indian retaliation or something like that. So they don't come. So these boys have to be, have a military escort to San Antonio. And along the way, the description was they were hellions on the trip home. 
I'm sure they were. They probably tried to escape several times. They were taken to San Antonio where their families had moved by that time. The, the Corns had moved to San Antonio um, pretty much to try to make a living. He had a, uh, the grandfather had a uh, confectioner's shop downtown in San Antonio, and that's the way he made his living. But they'd moved there, but the boys were just terrified of the big city. I mean, it scared them to death, and they were quiet and, you know, fearful and um, just didn't look like teenage boys probably should look. They were smaller for their age, just nutrition-wise probably were smaller for their age. Adolph did not recognize his father at all. Clinton Smith had a little bit happier reentry, except he got very bored on the farm, not much to do. And again, didn't want to sleep inside, wanted to sleep outside. Temple Friend, when he came back, wore his buckskin for the rest of his life because physically he began to decline and he died at 15. His story was much like Cynthia Ann Parker's in that he just kind of starved himself to death. He just was so unhappy that he wouldn't eat. Um, another interesting comment, and San Antonio's had such a such a remarkable history of famous people being here, and the poet Sidney Lanier was here writing during this time, and he describes Adolph uh, Korn, who was living in San Antonio at that point, as one of the odd personages and characters of the city. Um, Adolph could not settle down. He had minor criminal offenses. Um, he was... Um, just generally fearful of people, and it was just anti what we would call antisocial behavior, you know, real on his part. Um, the next part is all about how tough it was to even think about going on a reservation, but that is what they had to do. Let me see if we can find, well, I know that that bottom picture is of a reservation. Um, and cattle, and we'll talk. Okay, the top of the picture is uh, Adolf Fisher with one of his Indian friends. It's remarkable to have these pictures. And the one under that is, uh, oh, I love this one. This is Lehman and Gillette. Gillette is a famous Texas ranger. And they had had a very violent en encounter at one time in their life. And here they are shaking hands. Here they are shaking hands later in life. Okay, we'll go on and, and hear a little bit of, about more of the, of the boys mostly. We hear that there are not many writings by the girls. The boys are going to actually... Uh, not talk about it as much, but decide later in their life to write about it and tell their story. Okay. We talked a bit about the buffalo, and by... 1870, there was real fear, and I'm getting this out of my head from teaching. They don't talk about it much in here, in the book, but um, the dissemination of the buffalo, the lack of respect for the, the creature itself as a food source was one of the things that the Indians were most puzzled by most puzzled, because they these buffaloes were pretty much only killed for their hides and their tongues, which was a delicacy. The hides were wanted all over the world, and they were just left out on the plains to or wherever they were killed to, to rot, and it was something that the Indian tribes um, took personally. I mean, they really saw their life disappearing uh, because of this event, and could do nothing about it uh, whatsoever. It, it stirred up all kinds of battles. Um, Quana at this point, 
Laquana Parker at this point is the war chief of all the Comanches and the Quahadas. And there's two battles that, that need mentioning, um, and they are the last two in Texas. 1874 is Adobe Walls, and it was specifically targeted against buffalo hunters. And the Comanches had a well-planned uh, attack, and they just were going to get rid of those. And it wasn't very many of them, less than 20, uh, in an area in the Panhandle near Paladero, not down in Paladero. But I've, I've been to Adobe Walls, and it's just leftover old ruins. But they were using it as some shelter, and they are attacked. Not all of them are killed. They, they fight off this pretty... Um, you know, big group of Comanches, and in the book, Scott Zesch calls it a defeat for the Indians. It's not considered, you know, back then, and historically, it's not really considered a, a defeat because it's what stops the government and makes them think, well, you know what, we, we're going to have to slow down and and put some restrictions on the buffalo hunters and the buffalo skinners. But the next thing it does is the very next year, the U.S. government decides, you know, we've really had enough of this, and the Battle of Paladuro Canyon, which really is in Paladuro Canyon, was an attack on the Comanches by the U.S. Cavalry under Randall McKenzie, and they were soundly defeated, the Comanches were, but to top it off, and I think this was the, the idea in the beginning, Randall McKenzie had 1,500 horses killed that, at the end of the battle. Because, think about it for a minute, not only was the buffalo their source of life, but the horse was the way it happened. And the horse was what they were um, phenomenally talented, not just riding, but using in every way. And they're gone. So this, this is what stops Quanta Parker and says, uh, we can't battle this anymore. And he makes a, a very determined decision to convince his people to come in to the reservation. Um, Herman Lehman, at this point, is still part of the Comanche group. He is there at both of those battles. He's a young white captive. And white Indian is the term the book likes to use. I'm not sure that they liked that term, but that is a term that they used. Um, only the Apaches are, are left loose in Texas now, and it took a while, you know, to subdue them, but they're the ones that are left. And finally, in 1877, uh, Quanah persuades peace in, or, in order to save his people. And that's pretty much, and he says in, in a statement, I won't read it, but in a statement that he does this for his mother. He does this because he is part Comanche and part white, and he wants the Comanches to survive. And they did. There's a, there's a large group of Comanche families, um, towns in Oklahoma today, not in Texas, but in Oklahoma. Um, at this point, you can imagine, you know, what are we gonna do with the captives? They go, um, Quanta really encourages them to go home uh, many of them do, but he leaves quite open a, an eternal invitation to come back. And because he leaves that so clearly and kindly meant, many of them do go back for visits, go back to see them, spend um, types of festival days with them. When they know they're going to happen, they return. Uh, the last section of this book is interestingly called Redemption. I'm not sure why. I'm still sort of struggling with that a little bit um, because I guess it, it is redemption in that um, most of them get to go home or choose to go home. Um, they have a tough life at home. Most of the boys become cowboys, which would suit their life. Um, they couldn't stay cooped up inside any place. They remained illiterate. They just weren't the least bit interested in anything that had to do with school or learning. Um, they needed to roam. In fact, uh, they couldn't hold a job, failed marriages, just all the things that, that our, our life would probably say, this doesn't look good. They're not, they're not doing well you know, right now. 
Rudolf Fischer, on the other hand, chooses to go back, and I'm going to tell you about him in a minute, but a few more things about the uh, boys. They were closely attuned to the natural world. They could do all kinds of, had all kinds of knowledge of life, you know, living outside that uh, no one knew much about but tribes. Um, they still like to eat raw meat, preferably outside, but one of my favorite phrases in here, they didn't fret over anything. They didn't worry, they didn't fret. The future was not something they had any control over, so they truly did not fret over anything. Um, as I said before, they all went back to visit. Um, Rudolf Fischer actually chose to go back and stay and live with the Comanches. Um, he had two wives, but later in his life, he became a Catholic Christian. And at that point, and all of his, both his wives did and the children that they had. And at that point, they all sat down and talked about it, and they decided he had to divorce one of his wives because that wasn't right. So they amicably divorced. His wife then married someone else. They all lived right together. All of his children were educated. Uh, he made certain of that. So it's interesting to look back that, that Rudolf Fischer was the one that may look like he had the successful life, the life that um, was working well. The others really struggled financially. Um, I'm going to tell you very quickly about one thing. The Medicine Lodge Treaty, which was supposedly still working, was extremely diluted when they passed the Dawes Act. And the Dawes Act limited the amount of land. And this was actually done for many other reasons, but one of the reasons was Congress had thought that they had given away a little too much land to the Indians. So they decided to throw that in, in the Dawes Act, that, that it had all of the reservations had to be small, tiny, you know, not, not big. Um, two of the captives took their case to court to be adopted by their tribe. And the United States government instantly looked at that as, oh, they just want free land. That's the reason they want to be formally adopted. So both of those requests were rejected. On the other hand, all the buffalo hunters and skinners were awarded government reparations for their losses due to Native American tribes. They were all given, yeah. The last part of the book I think is so interesting um, because it talks about the memoirs, the publications that these uh, young men wrote. In 1912, Dot Babb wrote uh, In the Bosom of the Comanches. It almost became a movie. And by that time in 1912, there a lot of Native Americans had been in silent movies as they, you know, were depicting the western frontier. Dot Babb's book never made it to a movie, but it was in the Frontier Times, which is a little fun publication that I used to use with my kids also. Uh, in, in seventh grade Texas history as a, as a periodical type of publication that they could find things in. Uh, this is something more related to home, too. Between 1915 and 1924, uh, those years saw old pioneers, and we saw one right there, um, of Gillette and um, whoever the other opening was. Yeah, and Layman talking. And they had reunions, and at these reunions, the uh, Indian captives and then some other Indians would do uh, horseback riding tricks and all kinds of, like a festival, um, like, uh, and some were, took place down at Military Plaza, downtown at our, uh, in San Antonio. The old trail, trail Drivers Association was, um, and some of you in here may belong to the old trail drivers, I don't know, but the, they were formed in 1915, and several captives attended the 1924 meeting at the Gunter Hotel. I think there might be a picture. That was the previous street. Okay. Street. Right up there? That's, that's that's one more? Right there. There. 
Okay, on the bottom with all the guys standing out there, right. Well, this was at the gutter in 1924, and um, everyone it, in the description of it seemed to love it, get along well, except the Texas Rangers and the captives and that, that handshake right there. And, and it was said that it was a cautious type of relationship. They had both just remembered too much. They had both all just been through too much. Um, and I'd said the Indian captives often perform tricks. In uh, 1927, and I love the title of this book, Herman Lehman wrote um, a book called A Condensed History of the Apache and Comanche Indian Tribes for Entertainment and General Knowledge. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure he felt like it would be entertaining. It, it probably is. I haven't read that one. I have read the next one, Nine Years Among the Indians, 1870 to 1879 by Herman Lehman. And I've used it as a research source for my kids at times because it's it's a first-hand account of this is what happened to me um, in 1927 also the Smith brothers wrote um, the boy captives not don't like that quite as well it's just not as well written as the others um, but you can hear various publications the young men who wouldn't come back and tell about their experiences later in life want to write about them so everyone will know so everyone will know the, the real story um, in 1927, the old trail drivers decided to stage a, um, an entertaining, in, in San Antonio, an entertaining stagecoach um, attack. And different Indians were part of it, captives were part of it, old Texas rangers were part of it. But at one point, one of the Indians, you know, tore off his headdress and say, saying, that darn thing's too hot, you know, so... <laughs> So life had changed for them, too. In 1926, Herman Lehman left his family and lived the last six years of his life in Oklahoma. Um, many captives, after failed marriages, would live with one child for a while and another child for a while. They were still roaming, and you know, they were still needing, needing to roam. Um, Dot Bab gifted, and I've seen this, so this is important for me to say, a beautiful sinew and bead necklace, and it was given, he gave it, to the Panhandle Plains Historical Museum in Canyon. And if you haven't visited that museum, it's wonderful. It's great on native tribes, it's what, and it's, it's just south of Paladuro Canyon, so you want to throw that visit in too, to go to Paladuro, but also the museum there is wonderful. And this beautiful big necklace, and it has all kinds of shell beads, glass beads that were traded for, and all kinds of things on it. It's very, very pretty. Um, I'd like for us to end where we started, and that's Scott's um, trek, I guess, quest to find his grandfather, of which, at the end of the book, I would say he found out about him, but he didn't find out much to determine what kind of man he was because he had a really hard life once he came back um, with his family. Um, in two, he died in 1900. In 2000, he got a proper headstone, which his family decided was right, and he was buried with them now. And um, he had come back to Mason County in that area in uh, 1876, but just never been able to fit in, never been able to hold a job, had a hard time, didn't really have anyone that was a close friend. Um, and in 1893, he just dropped out of society completely. And let me, let me get to these. Okay, how'd I miss them? We're going we're to find these because in the book, if you've read it, you know he goes up and lives in some caves that are, well, they were. <laughs> we saw Sam and I went through each one of them. Let me go one more time. Let's see if there isn't. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, if you have your book, you'll see they are, they are big. 
openings, big caves. And we know we have caves all through, you know, right down the street from my house, you know, Robert's Cave is there. And then from there, all the way up through the hill country, we, we live on limestone and Glen Rose Rock, and you got holes in all of that. So um, there are lots of wonderful caves. He chose to leave and live up in those. And his family decides at the end of the book to go visit those caves and see what was it like? You know, why did, why did he live there? Um, was he lonely? Was he miserable? Well, they found them to be absolutely beautiful and really had this gorgeous view out onto the creek um, where he was and also very cool because the breeze blew in one way and came around another and he, he got all the, all the good, lovely cross, cross breeze in there. So it wasn't, it wasn't the uncomfortable, terrible place where he was hiding out. It was the place where, of comfort, you know, where he wanted to be. And, you know, even Scott is, Zesh is not sure why, you know, he would do this, but all I can think of in this young man's mind is how happy he was when he was with the Comanches that possibly they're keeping a vigil for his Comanche brothers that would never return. Um, and, and hopeful at that point every day. I wanna read something to you that Scott used to start the book actually. And it is credited to uh, an excerpt from Ecclesiasticus 44, but it really sums up the the captive life. Let us now sing the praises of our ancestors in their generations. There were those who were made a name for the, who made a name for themselves by their valor, those who gave counsel because they were intelligent, those who led the people by their knowledge of the people's lore, and then those who were honored in their generations and were the pride of their times. Of others there is no memory. They have perished as though they had never existed. They have become as though they had never been born, but their name lives on generation after generation. Thank you. It's co comments, questions, sorry to have gone so long, but please tell me if you're having, yes. Oh, right. And probably 20 years ago, we had a dedication service, and Huey Bear was our speaker, and his daughter was there, and I love his daughter. Oh, my goodness. This is, this is um, Clinton Smith's little brother, little brother, who it took longer to get him, you know, ransomed back, however they did it, than, than it did even Clinton. But he was ready to come back, too. He wanted to come back. And so he ends up in San Antonio. Wow, that's amazing. Anything? Yeah, when, 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 when the Geronimo was brought through, they had that at the five minutes. Right. They had a hard time communicating with him, so they sent the jet. Oh. Jet and Bob, who tells the story. They had a, a, there was an article, and I don't remember if it was a live or the Western News, uh, in 1940, they interviewed him, and he talked about. Mm -hmm. Wow, goodness. Well, our city has a, a remarkable history in many ways and just adding to it all the time. Other, I'll say, comments or corrections. Y'all have read it too. Many of you have read the book too. Anything you want to add? I just want to add, I think the Indians were very smart to think that it was to be. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Right. And none said a harsh word about them. In fact, missed them. Other other comments, thoughts. Thank you so much. It's a it's a fine book. If you haven't read it, it takes a little while, and some of it's hard to get through. But it's well worth it to know this specific history. Thank you again.